Hello, and welcome to Physician Focus. I'm Dr. Kathy Hughes, a general surgeon in Falmouth, Massachusetts. This program is brought to you by the Massachusetts Medical Society and HCAM TV. This month, we're looking at medical care during serious illness. Many of us, before we become seriously ill or old ourselves, have the experience of caring for a parent or another family member or friend during old age or advanced illness, sometimes through to the end of their life. That brings up a lot of challenges and questions. This episode of Physician Focus is about what you and your loved ones can do to make sure that their and your wishes and goals are honored. This helps us make the experience of serious illness or even the end of life the most comfortable and meaningful it can be. The key to all of this is talking with our loved ones ahead of time. And if we're facing this ourselves, it's vital that our loved ones and our doctors understand our values and goals, how we want to live, how we want to be cared for, and what's most important to us. Any priority is okay. What's most important is that we share it so that the people around us can know and support our choices. And if we're caring for someone else, it's vital that we know what matters to them so that we can honor their choices. Many of us feel uncomfortable at the prospect of having these conversations, but there are some great tools and resources that make it easier. In this episode of Physician Focus, we talk with two physicians. Both have many decades of experience caring for people with serious illness. Dr. Lachlan Faro is a general internist and the Director of Ethics and Palliative Care at Boston's Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center. He's an Associate Professor of Medicine at the Harvard Medical School. He chairs a committee for the Massachusetts Department of Public Health that's looking at how to improve medical care and patients' quality of life through serious illness. And he previously chaired the Massachusetts Expert Panel on End-of-Life Care. Our other guest is Dr. Robert Schreiber, a geriatrician. At Fallon Health, Dr. Schreiber is the Vice President and Medical Director of their Program of All-Inclusive Care for the Elderly, known as PACE. He's also on the faculty at Harvard Medical School, and he's the Senior Medical Advisor at Elder Services of the Merrimack Valley in Lawrence, Massachusetts. Previously, he served as the Physician-in-Chief of Hebrew Senior Life in Roslindale, Massachusetts. Lucy Barrington from the Massachusetts Medical Society talked with them both. Dr. Lachlan Faro and Dr. Rob Schreiber, thank you for coming to talk with me today. Between you and individually, you have decades of experience caring for people with serious illness, mm -hmm. and many of them are elderly. Now, many of us, before we become seriously ill or elderly ourselves, have the experience of caring for a parent or other loved one who is um, experiencing that. My own father is 90 years old. He has some serious health issues, and he's not doing so well. And of course, I want him to have the best care possible but I'm realizing that I don't really know what that means given his age and his health issues. So can you help me figure out how to approach that with him and his doctor and how I should start thinking about it? Dr. Schreiber. Yes, th well first thanks for the opportunity of having this discussion because I think it's really important and I think this is an opportunity to really talk about an issue that impacts us all. The issue that you're facing with your dad is one that I think uh, many of us face and I face personally. And when we talk about somebody who's not doing well, who's older, who has serious illness, it's really important to understand what is their goal? What do they want? Um, many times they understand that things are not going well. They have fears. And when you ask people how they're doing, they can be very upfront and they'll tell you that they know they're not doing well. And when you ask them what do they think is happening or you know, how many good years do they think they have left, it's pretty interesting. They can be very frank and honest and you know, you'll be surprised that maybe I have one or two good years. And I wouldn't be surprised if you asked your dad that. That's what he would say. The question then comes down to what's best care possible. Best care is really dependent on what he wants and what he's trying to achieve. What's important to his life? What makes him happy? What makes him sad? How does he want to live? How does he not want to live? Those are the types of issues that if you don't have a discussion with, it's very hard to determine what best care is. So we sometimes like leap into thinking about, oh, would my dad want this kind of thing or that kind of thing or that kind of thing medically? Stop and sort of back up. Your dad is a human being, he's 90. 
I'll often say, if I was talking to him, so uh, if you're in, we think of you as being in chapter 90 of the book of your life, and we're trying to figure out in whatever time's ahead, you know, how can I as your doctor help you? The uh, most important thing is you as a person, as you're looking ahead, what do you most hope for in whatever pages or chapters there might be? And then if I can get some sense of that, then I'll add a second question, which is not as much fun, but it's just as important. When you look ahead at whatever pages or chapters there might be, what do you worry about? What do you maybe never want to go through? Because we need to make sure that all the medical things make sense for you as a person. They get you the most possible of all the things you hope for. And anything you worry about, you never want to go through, we need to make sure if that's never going to happen or we have a plan if it ever does. But, but it's got to start and end with your dad as a person, as a human being. I and mean, I've heard a lot of stories from people whose parents and loved ones you know, died in the hospital, they were in pain, they weren't really fully conscious. I don't think it worked out the way that mm -hmm. they would have wanted. But one of the facts, and like we're Americans, Americans don't like to talk about this, that everybody knows is true for every single one of us is we're mortal. But Americans don't like to talk about that. And then if we've never talked about, like with your dad, um, about what's important to him between now and the end, but this really isn't primarily about dying. It's mm -hmm. about between now and that future time, how can your life be as good as it's possible to be? And then a part of that is, and if we ever got to, if it looked like we're in the last pages, you know, the last part, um, does your dad have thoughts about what he would want that to be? Some people don't. They just want it to be as far in the future as possible. But there are other people who, what they've really thought about is, if my time ever comes, I don't want to be in a hospital on machines. I want to be home. I want to be comfortable. I want family around. Well, unless we plan for that, at least in the United States, if there's some problem, someone's going to call 911, you're going to be in the hospital. It's not going to be that way. Okay. But having said that, but having said that, some people are the opposite. Um, they're not thinking about being peaceful, quiet at home. They want to go down fighting. If, if they can eke out any extra time, they'll put up with all kinds of things. When you have somebody who's ill, what is the expectation when you go into the hospital? How likely are you to have a recovery? And what does recovery mean? Does recovery mean that you're going to end up alive but living in the nursing home the rest of your life? Or is it likely that you're going to end up suffering for several months and maybe dying, which is very common in the older population at the end of life. We spend 50% of the healthcare dollar for Medicare in the United States in the last year of life. And it's not the type of life that Lachlan's bringing up in terms of what we want to try to achieve for you know, your dad. So having those discussions of really understanding what is likely to happen, how they want to live, you know, what a good life is about. Then when we get to the point where the options are one, where longevity is not going to be there, where they're probably going to suffer and they're not going to have quality, we can then talk about how do you want to live those remaining days of your life? What's important to you? What do you want to do? Who do you want to connect with? Who's important to see? What is the type of, um, messages and experiences you want to leave to those you care about. Every one of us knows we're mortal. Every one of us knows everyone we care about is mortal. This is, that fact is the yes. only thing in healthcare, maybe the only thing in life that we all know with 100% certainty mm -hmm. is going to come up, right? Number one, all of us, it yep. affects all of us. Yep. Number two, we really, really care how it goes. When it goes badly, you know, the last part of my mom or my dad's or a loved one's life when it goes badly, it's not just bad for the patient, for that person. Everyone who cared about that person, loved that person for the rest of their life is either angry or scarred or guilty or when it goes badly. When it goes well, mm -hmm. people are sad when they've lost someone they care about. But over and over, when they have the right kind of support, they look back and yes, it was sad, but that was some of the most meaningful time our family ever had. Right? So it's really, really important to get this right in human terms. Um, 
But there's no chance of that if we don't, all of us, mm -hmm. get better at talking about it. And I, and I can promise you, not 100%, I can promise you, your dad has thought about these things, but unless your dad has said things to people, nobody can know how to really make the time ahead the way he would want. So I'm realizing that we need to have those conversations. I'm not entirely confident that I know how to do that. I think most important, still relatively uh, new resources is an initiative called the Conversation Project. Um, Conversation Project was uh, uh, catalyzed by uh, Ellen Goodman, a uh, longtime Boston Globe Pulitzer Prize winning, col uh, winning columnist, because she one day when she was mm -hmm. an active columnist working on deadline, gets a call from the nursing facility where her mom was with advanced dementia. We think your mom may have pneumonia. Do you want us to start antibiotics? We need to know now. Mm -hmm. And then Ellen said, like, what are you asking me? Mm -hmm. you know, she hadn't thought about that. Um, she said, you know, back before the dementia, I thought my mom and I had talked about all of this. But there was no plug. We actually hadn't talked about this in any way that was helpful. So Ellen, talking to other people and finding almost everyone she knew had some similar experience, said, we need to find a way to talk about this and started this organization, wonderful organization called The Conversation Project which with lots of work with patients and families now has something called the Conversation Starter Kit. So you can go to the website, conversationproject.org, download the Conversation Starter Kit. My family has used this. I mean, I'm supposed to be an expert about this, but there's just something really nice about a user-friendly, concrete thing to look through, write down, jot down answers, and talk. So that's one resource that I think anybody watching this uh, and people they know would find very helpful. Just to add to um, what was stated, um, they have actual videos of people having that conversation and how to start the conversation. I'm also interested in this idea of the healthcare proxy. Can you explain more about how, what that means and how it works and how that could help my father get what he wants? So it's important that everybody have a healthcare proxy and not just older people, but anybody over the age of 18 is a document where you basically appoint someone to be your decision maker along healthcare matters in the event that you are unable or incapacitated to make decisions for yourself regarding healthcare decisions. And so without that, without appointing someone over 18, if there is disagreement in your family, then there could be strife and you may not have somebody, one, that's speaking for you. You could have different voices and be put in a situation where you're having things done to you and for you that may not be what you want. Right. And so as a result, it can become you know very, very challenging. So it's really important that people not only appoint somebody who can do this substitute judgment legally. And by the way, you don't need to see an attorney. There's forms you can download from you know, the web if in Massachusetts and get it signed. So that's your official form. But it's also important to have that discussion about okay. in the situation, if I was seriously ill, the types of treatments you, know, you would or would not want to have. Now, normally, most people our age or younger or even older, you know, who are in good health would probably want to have everything done, you know, full treatment. But your dad, who's at the end of his life, relatively speaking, you know, in the 90th chapter, you know, that's a different situation. Mm -hmm. They may not want and usually do mm -hmm. not want everything done. They've lived a full life. They want to make those remaining days, months, years meaningful and one that is filled with quality and joy, not pain and suffering. So it needs to be available you know, when it's needed, which means his doctor should have a copy. Um, if, if you're the person who's his healthcare proxy, then you should have a copy. It can be a friend or somebody, mm -hmm. sometimes even someone with a little bit more emotional distance because um, some people say like, I know my wife or my daughter could never do X, Y, or Z, say X, Y, or Z, and I don't want her to worry about that. But you need to have somebody who is prepared to be your voice, 
if you can't speak for yourself, or else you may not be taken care of the way you want. People, people who've lost someone, being able to look back and say, you know, I miss him, but he, he was taken care of the way he would have wanted, and the last part of his life was as much the way he would have hoped as it possibly could have been. Those are amazing, priceless things to be able to say. Mm. And that's the payoff of having these conversations. Mm. Right? I had a patient by the name of Betty who was on dialysis and had finally decided no more. She had been suffering, struggling, and her daughter and her son were really, couldn't accept it. But she had made the decision, we supported it, and she ended up going to a nursing home to basically die. Those last seven days were the best days of her life in the last eight years of her life. To mm -hmm. the point she got to see everybody, people from all over the country came to visit her. She was literally the queen on a throne. There was a sign-in book. There were parties. She had lobster. She, at all the things she wanted to do, she did not have pain. Mm -hmm. She was off of pain medicines. And then when she finally died after eight days, she died within 12 hours, but having done everything she wanted to the point that the daughter who was struggling with this decision became a volunteer mm. for hospice services wow. and <clears throat> continues to work in that capacity. Real life story about what no, happens when people's wishes and goals are met. No, you talk to people who work in hospice um, and they have countless stories that are variations, variations like that. Um, but just even, even worth, um, there's people hear the word hospice and go, oh no, 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 that mm -hmm. not, not now, no, I'm, either, I'm not gonna die, my mom's not gonna die. The biggest mistake people think about hospice, like, because they hear that word is, oh, that's where you go to die, mm -hmm. which is not at all what any hospice nurse mm -hmm. I know thinks she does. So, so tell us, what, what is hospice care, and how is that different from this other term I hear, palliative care? Yeah, so, so hospice so, is care through the end of life. For the philosophy is for people who've said, I'm now focusing on each day, one day at a time, making it as good as it can be. I'm not going to sacrifice today or tomorrow for medical treatments, chemotherapy, other things that may make me sicker this week, but maybe there's a payoff down the road. You know, I'm, I'm moving into one day, one week at a time, make it as good as it can be. They have countless stories of reconciling family members, somebody's joined hospice. It's, it's a difficult um, adjustment initially for some family members going, oh my God, mom, no, 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 you need to have more chemotherapy, whatever. But the hospice people have enormous skill in helping people really understand this is what mom wants. Mm. And then the kicker, um, more and more studies are now starting to show is that people who enter hospice early, not just the last mm -hmm. couple of days of life, live often at least as long, and sometimes longer, than the people who are going ambulance back and forth to the hospital. And when someone has the support at home and their days are as good as they can be, their will to live is stronger, like, then I wanna say, well, like, of course they're gonna live at least as long that way. One of the, one of the other common mistakes, and even doctors often ask this is, you know, to be a mistake asking your dad, uh, uh, so what's important to you, length of life or quality of life? <laughs> Honestly, they usually are not alternatives, they usually go together. So you mentioned palliative care, and it sounds like it's not the same thing as hospice care. Yeah, so. Correct. How does that work? Uh, so it, it, it is and it isn't. Palliative care is hospice care, but it's, it's palliative care at the end of life, but palliative care also involves people who are going through pain and suffering from surgery that are gonna have a full recovery, or people who have chronic illness who are declining, where their goal is to minimize their pain and suffering and live their best possible life. It's, palliative care is a discipline, it's actually a medical specialty, but in fact, internists, geriatricians such as myself, and surgeons, we all do palliative care with the goal of trying to improve people's quality of life, but at the same time giving them the best outcome possible. So if you look at a spectrum from well to end of life, palliative care encompasses the entire spectrum of care, 
but hospice care is really palliative care at the end of life where the goal is your quality and comfort. Okay, thank you. Now, I also um, got some advice that my father should fill out a MOLST form. Mm, what, yeah. what does that mean? M-O-L-S-T, Medical Orders for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Right? It's basically just a form of piece of paper that is standardized across Massachusetts, having learned from other states where this was so helpful, that is recognized by anyone. EMTs, 911 comes to your house, and they don't know your dad, they're not sure like what he would want. This most form very clearly says he would or wouldn't want X or Y specific things, and people will follow it. But honestly, the point is can't be the form, because what's on that form is only good guidance or not if it, getting back to where we started the whole conversation, if it really fits your dad as a person, and helps make sure he's being taken care of the way he would want. But if you haven't had a, that other conversation, I'm not sure I'd, I'd find the most form particularly helpful. It's also important that the most form be used at the appropriate time. The most form really is to focus on those people who have limited life expectancy or have very clear directives because of an illness that they have of things that they would not want to have or would want to have. Yeah. The, the, the default is going to be somebody comes in an emergency, we do everything possible right. to keep you alive. But, but some people use the most form to make sure they're getting every possible thing mm -hmm. because they may have advanced cancer right. or other things, but their first great grandchild is going to be born in two months. So their most form may be the way to say, do every possible thing to keep me alive because they want to see their first great grandson. That makes sense. So, so this conversation that <laughs> my siblings and I obviously need to have with our dad, what is the best time for us to, to broach this with him? Honestly, the, uh, I often say it's always too early until it's too late. So you need to think about the earliest, soonest time to try to bring it up. And there are lots of different um, hooks that you can have. The Mass Medical Society years ago um, started a program that we've used at Beth Israel Deaconess now for almost 20 years around Thanksgiving mm -hmm. holidays um, with a, because humor can help, and it's talk turkey days. Time to talk turkey. And we actually jokingly, but seriously, pass out over a thousand healthcare proxy forms to everyone and actually say, blame us, Dad, I was at the hospital and they were saying like, have you talked to your you know, family about this? And I realized I hadn't. Just some excuse to bring it up. Mm -hmm. And then a second thing is, this can feel like a burden. Oh my God, what a difficult, heavy conversation. I mean, it can feel like that. But honestly, it's a gift from your dad to you mm -hmm. to be able to uh, have his daughter know in case you're ever on the spot. Um, it's a gift um, uh, from you to your dad mm -hmm. so that he knows he'll be taken care of the way he would want. And the people who've had these conversations, they often say, you know, it was like so hard to get started. It's like this big speed bump. It's hard to get started. But all of a sudden, I was like talking to my dad about like the meaning of life kinds of things that I haven't done since I was like seven or 10 years old. Right. The, right. So it's hard to get started, but I would say the first, soonest opportunity you can think, try. When you're all together. I had a son who was um, serving in the military and was going to Okinawa and was going to be going to active duty. Another hook, and again, it's blending humor, but is, is um, every year starting April 16th, <laughs> used to be National Healthcare Decisions Day. Now it starts April 16th, National Healthcare Decisions Week. Okay. Have these conversations. Why okay. April 16th? Because April 15th is tax day. And death and taxes are the two inevitable uh, things. Um, one, one more thing I wanted to bring up. I have a friend who is going through this with her mother, who is 85. She's a person of color. She has always been nervous about trusting the medical profession for historical reasons, I think. And that is seems to be another challenge that her family is facing. It is oh, harder is a, for her mother. This is a great topic and we could do a whole other show, we'd be happy to do sometime, about the, uh, the real reasons, the, the good reasons why um, people who are marginalized in any way, and it can be African American, it can be lower socioeconomic, it can be other ways, mm -hmm. um, and don't trust our health system, have 
both special challenges in this area, but maybe even more importantly, to talk with them and help them understand and make sure the health system knows this is what they want and it's respected. Uh, there's a wonderful statewide organization, just a few years old, called the Massachusetts Coalition for Serious Illness Care. Very simple, one-line goal, make sure everyone in Massachusetts is always taken care of the way they would want. They did a survey last year of people across Massachusetts asking about the quality of the care of a loved one in the last part of life. And it was hauntingly uh, worrisome results. Um, people saying how often the care was not excellent or good, how often their loved one's wishes were not respected, and much, much worse quality of care, much, much worse mm -hmm. how often their loved one's wishes were not respected for non-white, lower socioeconomic, just exactly these populations. Right. And so it is even more important, if it's possible, right. to make sure that people in those communities themselves and there are churches um, uh, uh, in inner city Boston that are taking leadership roles in this, have these conversations, and they're in charge. Right. Thank you very much, Dr. Lachlan Farrow and Dr. Rob Schreiber, for coming to talk with us. Uh, Lucy, thank you so much for this. Thank you. It was an honor today, Lucy. Okay. When end-of-life care follows the patient's wishes and goes as planned, many loved ones say it's one of the most meaningful times of their lives. When the goals, values, and wishes are honored, we all draw comfort from that. The conversation about how we want to live is one of the greatest gifts we can give to the people we care about and to ourselves. Some excellent resources can help us with this, such as The Conversation Project at theconversationproject.org. It's also important to appoint a healthcare proxy. This is someone who can speak for us if we're not able to speak for ourselves. And when we're the one facing serious illness, it makes sense to fill out the MOLST form clarifying what kind of care we would want. To learn more about how professionals are working to improve these experiences, check out the Massachusetts Coalition for Serious Illness Care at maseriouscare.org. Thank you to Dr. Lachlan Faro and Dr. Robert Schreiber for answering our questions. I'm Dr. Kathy Hughes. On behalf of the Massachusetts Medical Society and HCAM-TV, thank you for tuning in to the Physician Focus. So what are the signs of an opioid overdose, and how can I recognize that somebody is experiencing one? Well, they're actually pretty easy to spot. A person who is experiencing an overdose may appear confused and have a decreased level of consciousness and alertness. They also may have constricted pupils. When you see somebody who's experiencing an overdose, the number one most important thing to do first is to call 911. Next, do rescue breathing. And finally, take out your naloxone kit and administer the naloxone. Naloxone comes in an easy to use package with instructions for how to use it. Each box of naloxone may look different. They're all very easy to use and you do not need medical training in order to use it. So who should have nasal naloxone? Well, everybody should have it to help a loved one who may be suffering from a substance abuse disorder or just to help a stranger in need. Obtaining naloxone is easy. You can obtain it from your doctor, from a pharmacy standing order, or from any of the Department of Public Health sites. By just following these simple steps, you might just be able to save a life. I'm Dr. Melissa Wood. And I'm Dr. Nandita Scott. Cardiovascular disease is the number one cause of death in American women, claiming nearly 400,000 lives each year, more than all cancers combined. Yet nearly half of women are unaware that heart disease, along with stroke, pose the biggest threats to their health. It is important that women recognize their risk factors for heart disease. Amongst the biggest risks are family history and age. Heart disease that has affected a brother, sister, father, or mother is a particular concern, and the risk rises as we get older. The good news is that many other risk factors can be controlled with lifestyle changes. Keep your blood pressure and cholesterol in check, don't smoke, eat a healthy diet, exercise, and maintain a healthy weight. We urge you to talk with your healthcare provider and get screened to determine your risk of heart disease. For more information, visit the American Heart Association at goredforwomen.org.